Hi there, everybody. My name is Jeremy Siskin. Welcome to my home studio in Long Beach, California, where it's really actually a chilly day. I swear, even if you don't believe me, I promise you, it's chilly. Today, I want to talk about playing solo jazz piano at any level. Um, playing solo jazz piano is one of my huge interests. Um, I don't want to brag, but I participated in a lot of solo piano competitions. I also wrote a book called Playing Solo Jazz Piano. And for better or for worse, in this age of pandemics and social isolations, I think it's actually really important for us and our students to understand the key techniques to playing solo jazz piano, um, even though it's difficult. And so I want to start by kind of just introducing some of these uh, challenges. Um, but first, this is my book called Playing Solo Jazz Piano. Um, and we're going to be working with this tune called On the Sunny Side of the Street. Probably many of you might be familiar with it. It's a very cheery tune. Um, and on a basic level, it goes something like this. than enough material to chew on. So one of our big goals today is to approach this tune on many different fronts to see how many different ways we can perform it at the piano at some different levels. So here's one of the main challenges for playing solo jazz piano, and that is that we have three elements that we have to cover in jazz. And you know, this is actually true for a lot of kinds of music. We have the bass, and the bass rhythmically is showing us where the strong beats of the measure are so that we can have syncopation against it. Um, and the bass really needs to be on a very particular part of the piano. Um, the bass, if you think of the instrument, it has four strings. It would be this low E and then up from there, A, D, and G. And of course the bass can go higher than that open G, G string, but we generally kind of want to keep the bass within these two octaves, these two lowest octaves of the piano. The chords are covering, of course, the harmony. And in jazz, we like big, thick chords. Rhythmically, generally, jazz chords are not on the strong keys, right? These are part of what's going to be syncopated. And we like the chords to provide color, and we like to provide some rhythm with the chords. Generally, chords sound the best in the octave around middle C. Kind of in this general territory, that's where chords are going to speak. Of course, if we go lower with them, it ends up sounding muddy. If we go higher, it sounds okay, but it doesn't have that really meaty quality of filling out the sound of the harmony, and we might get into the way of the melody. Which brings us to our last element, which of course is the melody. Um, and in jazz, we might be improvising a melody, or we might be playing a written out melody. Um, but we want to have some flexibility to create interesting lines and interesting shapes. This is what we actually love in jazz. Whereas a lot of classical music, you know, you might have arpeggios in the melody, you might have scales. Um, of course, there's a lot of possible things. But in jazz, we love these surprising angular shapes. And these often take a lot of your hand to make them happen. So I want to give you this quick crash course in jazz harmony. And, you know, this is certainly something that you could study in college for however many semesters you can imagine, um, but I'm gonna go through it in about two minutes. <laughs> so the bass plays the root of the chord. So if you have a C major chord, the bass is usually playing a C. We wanna hear that bass in as low of a register as possible. Remember, kind of in that range between the very first E and two E's above. Then the two essential tones that we talk about for jazz chords are the third and the seventh. So if it's a C major, we really wanna have these notes C, E, and B. Notice I'm putting that third and seventh right in that register around middle C for maximum exposure. The reason that these two notes are important, first of all, they create a lot of harmony with the root as you can hear, but second of all, they define what kind of a chord we have. With just that root, third, and seventh, we can tell whether it's a major seven, minor seven, or dominant seventh chord. Of course, there's things we can't tell about the chord. We might not know whether it has a flat five or a flat nine, uh, but it gives us the anchor 
um, above which we can kind of change some things with the court. And then the third aspect um, is that above that anchor, to continue this metaphor, uh, musicians like adding color notes, right? Um, if you listen to jazz, you know that we don't stop at three note chords. We love adding more and more notes. Um, and I made a little diagram of color notes for you, and I'm gonna have to make the iPad bigger for this. Um, for any chord, the fifth and the ninth are gonna be really good color notes. So if I have the root here, the third and the seventh, and then I add the fifth and the ninth, we actually get a very classic jazz voice. But then each different kind of chord, and these are our three principal kinds of chords in jazz, um, have some other color tones available as well. For major chords, we can use the 13th, which is the same as the sixth note of the scale. For minor chords, we can use the 11th, which is the same as the fourth note of the scale. And then for dominant chords, we have this really long list because for dominant chords, we can add what we call altered tones, which are tones a half step away from the fifth or the ninth, which, which create the rich tension that a lot of people love in jazz harmonies. Okay, so if I have a C dominant seventh, I could add, I have D flat and A flat, the flat nine and the flat 13th. Or I could add D sharp and F sharp, the sharp 11 and the sharp nine. And there's a million other combinations. So you can see once we get to dominant chords, we have a ton of stuff that we can add. All right, so that's your jazz harmony crash course. So then the question comes back to these elements in terms of how we put them on the piano. Um, and then rhythmically, how are we going to keep them all interesting? How are we going to be able to balance the three different elements? So here's our tune again. I'm going to get this in your ear one more time. We're just going to look at these first four measures of On the Sunny Side of the Street. teaching a beginner and they're insisting that they want to learn to play solo jazz piano, I should pause here and say that usually I suggest that people play in a group first. And I'll tell you the reason. Um, there's a few reasons. First of all, jazz is social music and you're going to get a lot more out of it if you're listening to others, um, having conversations about how to play, um, and enjoying the social aspect of it. And then the second reason is even more important because it's much easier to play as part of a group than at a beginner level. And in fact, um, I think students tend to learn more and more quickly as part of a group because there's not so much to do and they've got to keep track. They've got to keep time with the drums and the bass. They can't um, you know, take a couple extra beats if they need to somewhere. So there's a lot of pressure to get up to speed. But again, with the pandemic, you know, with social is isolation, um, with just people's preferences, sometimes beginners do want to play solo jazz piano. So um, here's where I would start them. Um, so the first thing would be to not play the chords at all, to play only the root in the left hand and the melody in the right hand. great time to talk with your students about personalizing the melody. One of the things to know about jazz melodies is that even though they might be written a certain way, it's not actually expected that the musician will play them exactly as written. For instance, we might change the rhythm, we might add grace notes, we might double up and repeat some notes, um, we might add in things like turns or other ornamental um, personalizations. So with just the bass note and the melody, the challenge is how much music could you make? That's already a really good exercise and it's getting the student used to what it's like to be a jazz musician, which is not pl playing something other than what's exactly on the page even while they have a somewhat simple task in front of them. Of course, I don't expect them to improvise just what I 
did right there. Um, I would start them with really simple things. What if you used some repeated notes? Sorry. Or what if you used a grace note? jazz mindset of creating things that aren't necessarily written note for note on that page. Continuing on, then you could look at that same passage, but coordinate half notes instead of just holding a whole note. And here I'm just repeating these half notes again and again. I should say I'm repeating the same note, the root of the chord twice. Unless the chord changes on B3 like it does there. Why is it useful to repeat the root in half notes? One of the things that we're building towards is what we call a bass in two, and that's a melodic bass played in half notes. And there's two challenges there. The first is making the bass melodic, but the second is just the coordination of playing a melody in one hand and half notes in the other hand. And so by repeating the root, they're tackling that coordination problem without having to tackle the problem of making the bass more melodic. Um, and then the next step could be quarter notes, and that's working your way towards a walking bass, which is pretty far in the future. Um, <laughs> coordination issues, um, but without really a lot of difficulty or without a lot of having to think about notes in particular. This is a good time to talk about one of the questions I sometimes get about bass lines, which is that some musicians like to accent beats two and four in bass lines, whereas others don't. My philosophy um, is that if you're playing without drums, it is appropriate to give a little bit of an accent to beats two and four because it replaces the accent that would be given by the hi-hat. Um, if you're playing with drums, then I would not accent beats two and four. And in fact, if you listen to the great bass players playing you know, in a quartet, quintet, sextet um, context, they don't really accent two and four more than one and three. They play a really nice smooth line. So I think it's okay to do it without drums. If you're playing with drums, I would not accent. I think that's the proper, <laughs> the proper way to play jazz. Um, all right, I'll make this iPad bigger so you can see. So the next step would be to get what I just a nice root position voicing. Some students will be ready to make inversions really quickly, um, and I think it's fine. But I think for other students, just that visual of starting an E chord, E seven chord on an E, is really helpful as a first step. So. Again, as a first step, I would just block it out. It doesn't sound amazing, um, but it sounds good enough and we're starting to uh, find the notes of the chord. One really easy way to get it to sound better quickly is actually to omit the fifth of the chord. Um, and look at what happens when we do this. We actually get just that three note chord with the root and our two essential tones, the third and the seventh. sounds so much uh, more resonant than the version that's just a stack of thirds, C, E, G, B. Notice also the range that we're in here. Now we're getting into chord range, so we're not thinking so low like we were with the bass. Now we're getting towards the middle of the piano instead. Okay, so now it's starting to get a little bit more complicated. Remember we said that one of the things that chords do 
uh, or that jazz pianists do with chords, I should say, is we like to add some syncopation. We like for that to be one of the rhythmic motors of the tune. And so what we do is we add what we call comping rhythms. I think many of you are probably familiar with this word comping, but comping is short for accompanying or complementing. And when you hear a great jazz pianist comp, you're probably not gonna notice any sort of repeated pattern in their comping. Because when great jazz pianists comp, they're responding to other people in the band. They're responding to the drums, the bass, the soloist, the melody, maybe what they're doing in their own right hand. And so their comping is gonna be constantly changing. Just like when we have a conversation, you know, we're not repeating the same phrases over and over again. We're responding to what's happening in the moment, hopefully. <laughs> I've had some of the other kind of conversations too. Um, but as we're learning jazz piano, we can't just tell our students, oh, do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, just do random things uh, and it'll sound fine. What we want to do is we want to train them in some traditional comping rhythms and give them, get them the expertise to eventually mix and ornament those rhythms. So uh, I'll play you what is here, and then I want to talk to you about the three comping rhythms that I teach primarily in my studio. So that comping rhythm is known as the Charleston, an incredibly important rhythm in jazz. Uh, the Charleston is played on beats one and the and of two. It's named after this great James P. Johnson piece that launched a dance craze. Hear that rhythm? Uh, 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 uh. One and the and of two is known as the Charleston. And despite how that example just sounds, when beginning pianists start comping, we want them to comp everything short. So if I go back to this example, um, I'm playing. Playing everything short. Listen to what happens if I do it the other way, if I play everything long. starts getting incredibly heavy, right? And we really don't want that. We want to start short, and then eventually we can add accents um, and longer notes in strategic places. But for now, um, especially at a beginner level, and even at an intermediate level, I start everybody with short comping. Now, some people ask about uh, notationally, I've written this rhythm as a quarter note and then an eighth note. And people ask, should that quarter note be longer? And the answer is no, both notes are equally short. It just makes clearer notation to write a quarter note on the beat and an eighth note off the beat. So articulation wise, I want both of these short and the same, but it would just be very confusing to read eighth note, eighth rest, eighth rest, and then eighth note again. The reverse Charleston is also a fantastic comping rhythm. It feels a little bit more relaxed than the Charleston, and it starts off of beat one, which can be confusing for people uh, from a classical background who are, if you think about it, we're used to everything, like every beat one being filled up, having some content there, usually a bass note. Um, but in jazz, since we have a bass player who's filling that in, the chords are often, again, gonna be on these off beats. So I really recommend to students that they tap their foot and rely on that rather than their fingers to keep the time here, because this would be like this. on the and of one and beat three, as you can see. Before students move on, uh, there's a million things to do before students move on, but one of them is to mix and play some Charleston and some reverse Charleston. I'll make the keyboard bigger so you can watch. So um, I'll start with the Charleston. Reverse. Charleston. Reverse. Charleston. Reverse. And then flip. Um, 
pumping rhythm, I usually wait about six months to teach this. And I teach a jazz piano course at my community college, um, and this doesn't make it into the first semester. This is a second semester proposition. And uh, it's called the Red Garland Rhythm. It's named after the great jazz pianist Red Garland, who played in Miles Davis's first quintet. Um, and he was known for just sticking with this rhythm for minutes on end, uh, which is why we gave it uh, a name right after him. And this rhythm is anticipating the strong beats. So if beats one and three are the strong beats of the measure, this is going to come in an eighth note before each of those beats on the and of four and and of two. And because we're thinking of it as an anticipation of the strong beat, we're going to play the chord that's about to happen at all times. So here, your comping is actually going to start even before beat one of the piece. So it'll be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And this comping rhythm is so great because the in the drums, one of the signature elements of swing drums is a ride cymbal pattern, right? Ride cymbal is kind of the main melodic symbol that drummers use. And, and the classic jazz pattern is ting, tink, a ting, tink, a ting, tink, a ting, tink, a one, two, and three, four, and one. And this matches up with all of the cuz of the tink, a ting. It's one, tink, a ting, 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 a ting. So when pianists are using this pattern with drummers, everybody's swinging together. And this is hitting the most important offbeats in these measures. So if I were going to do this on the sunny side of the stream, Until second semester to teach it, the reason is that all the other patterns I showed you have some sort of a note on the beat, but this is all off beats. So you have to have a really, really good internal sense of the rhythm before you start working on a pattern like this, because this is not going to give you any landing places on the rhythm. At least in the Charleston, you're starting right on beat one. In the reverse Charleston, you're landing on beat three. So you have something to latch onto. The Red Garland Rhythm, if you don't have a really good internal pulse, you don't have anything to latch onto. So I uh, don't suggest introducing that too early. Hey look, it's time for intermediate level. This is where I would pause for questions if that were a thing, but it's not a thing right now. Um, hopefully I'm present and I'm taking questions in the chat, um, but let's look at what we can do with slightly more advanced students. So we can introduce a bass line in a two feel. Um, in two means that it's dividing the bar in two, which means that we're playing half notes. So we already prepared for this rhythmically, right? Remember we were repeating the, the root note. But in for actual jazz basses, uh, they like to make the bass line melodic, meaning that we're not just gonna repeat the root note, we're going to place a different note on beat three. And I'm gonna give you three different, easy, hopefully, formulas for this. Um, before I do, I wanna remind you that we're keeping the bass very low in the piano. Remember that that lowest string of the bass is the lowest E on the piano. I also wanna let you know that we're gonna play this legato, and this is sometimes unintuitive for pianists because we see jazz bassists play pizzicato and we think of pizzicato as being short or staccato. But in fact, the strings of the bass are so long that when a bassist plucks, it lasts, the sound definitely lasts all the way until the next note. So uh, we wanna play all of our bass lines, legato with absolutely no space in between. So your first formula is right here and that would be to play the root on the beat, on the downbeat, and then the fifth of the chord on beat three. And this is kind of your classic polka, jug band, uh, bluegrass. <laughs> this should be a very familiar sound in any kind of American or I think a 
lot of European music too. Uh, so it sounds like this. time gets a little bit old before I show you that next pattern though I want to show you one thing which is that I want you to notice that in measure one the bass line goes down from the root to the fifth whereas in measures two and three the bass line goes up from the root to the fifth and you want to keep some variety in the directionality of the bass line because if you're always going up you're probably gonna climb higher and higher of course the inverse is true if you're always going down um, so Anybody playing bass on the bass or on the piano needs to be comfortable going up from the root to the fifth or going down from the root to the fifth. And that's true with all of these other bass patterns as well. This next one is also very important. And here we're playing the root on beat one and then the third of the chord on beat three. And we get the third, you know, whether, uh, whether it's a minor or major third depends on the kind of chord. If it's a major or dominant chord, we'll use a major third. If it's a minor chord, we'll use a minor third. Um... So again, um, here in these first three measures, I went up every single time, but I certainly didn't have to. I could go down from the root to the third. Now actually what's kind of interesting here is there's a little lesson to be learned from measure one to measure two, which is that on beat three of measure one we have an E, and on beat one of measure two we have an E. We don't really like having the same note twice in a row. So what I did here is I put them in different octaves, right? I, I went up to this E and then down to that one so that we're not repeating the exact same pitch twice in a row, because that can be kind of distracting. There's one more lesson to think about, which is that sometimes I get the question of, you know, is it permitted to go below that E natural, that's the lowest bass string? Um, and I say, you know what, We're, we play a piano, not a bass. Um, and I think it's okay to go a few pitches below that E natural, and it will still sound legitimate to the style of the bass. Some bassists you guys might know have an extension that gets you all the way to a C natural, so some basses can play lower anyway. But there's no need to really limit yourself to what the bass can play. This third, um, this third potential bass in two formula is pretty interesting and it actually teaches us quite a bit about jazz. And here what we're doing is we're putting the root on the beat, on the downbeat. And then on beat three, we're playing something that's completely unrelated to the chord, right? If you look at the first measure, D sharp has nothing to do with C major. What each of these is doing is it's just going a half step away from the chord to come. So that D sharp doesn't have anything to do with C, but it's leading to E. The G flat in measure two doesn't have anything to do with E7, but it's leading to F. I call this root scoop. You're playing the root on the downbeat and then a note that scoops either from below or above into the next measure. For some of you, this might be really dissonant, um, but one thing to keep in mind as you learn jazz, if you're coming from a classical background, is that jazz can hold a lot more dissonance than classical music. Um, well, than most types of classical music that, you know, they're in the classical romantic era. Um, in jazz, we're very comfortable with a little bit of discomfort as long as it resolves properly. We don't do things that are crazy and don't resolve, but we will create a lot of tension and then resolve it. So, you know, for instance, on beat three of that first measure, we have an E natural against a D sharp. Um, so that's a pretty dissonant interval but it resolves on beat one of the next measure. So see if it bothers your ear, or if you might not have even noticed it. It's colorful, but as soon as it resolves in that next measure, um, it actually sounds okay. Of course, you can be the judge of that for yourself, 
But if you're interested in learning more about jazz, I would encourage you to be more open to these temporary dissonances. So I want to be clear that these three formulas are not supposed to be used in isolation. It's not that you have to choose a path and say, I'm going to do all root fifth, or I'm going to do all root third, or I'm going to do all root scoop. In fact, that's the opposite of what you want to do. I'm giving you options because it's only by mixing them that you're going to create a baseline that has a lot of personality, has a lot of variety, and generally sounds legitimate to the jazz style. So um, these three are options to be mixed in order to create something, um, something that sounds like a, what a jazz bassist might play. Okay, now I want to discuss a whole category of things, which I refer to as shuttling. And shuttling is essentially a way that one hand fulfills two roles by jumping back and forth. Um, remember, when I say roles, I'm thinking back to the very beginning of the presentation where we were talking about the melody, the chords, and the bass. And there's a few ways that we can fill in these roles, um, but so far we've just kind of been leaving one of them out. But here, we're shuttling between the bass and the chords in the left hand. So the right hand's playing the melody, and then the left hand's covering both things. Now, this is slightly different than stride piano. Let me play it for you first, and then I'll tell you how it's different than stride piano. Um, piano bigger. I, I'm sorry, I'll do just a little bit. Okay, so how is that different than stride piano? Stride piano is based at least mostly in quarter notes. Okay, uh, we'll talk about this more in a sec, but that would be... A similar thing in terms of going back and forth between melody or sorry between bass and chords um, but in stride piano it tends to be quarter notes shuttle I like I like that word because it could be you know a bigger category of things another kind of left hand shuttle um, is what we call the piece piece pattern which is bass chord chord bass bass kinds of other left hand shuttle patterns, you know, I, I think of, <laughs> I'm total novice at tango, but I think of I think of that as something of a tango pattern, um, and that would be using a shuttle technique as well. But let's look a little bit more specifically at what's happening here. First of all, I hope everybody recognized this rhythm, because uh, this is the Charleston rhythm, right? The bass is being played on beat one, and then the mid-range chord is being played syncopated on the end of two. So actually, this is such a great way to fulfill what I introduced at the beginning because the bass is keeping time right on the beat in the low register, and then the chords are providing that syncopation in the middle register. Now, you might notice that the chords probably look weird to you if you're not a schooled jazz musician. Um, they, the C chord, for instance, doesn't have a C. The E chord doesn't have an E. And they have these kind of unusual uh, uh, on irregular interval patterns. Um, lumpy is the word I was looking for, interval pattern. Um, but in terms of how you get those chords, if we look at this first one, it's got E and B, which are the third and the seventh in C major. And then it has an A natural, which is the sixth or the thirteenth, one color tone. Okay, Two essential tones, one color tone. This next chord has is an E7, it has G sharp, which is the third, D, which is the seventh, and then F, which is the flat nine, which works because it's a dominant chord. So this has two essential tones, one color tone. This F major chord, it's an F6, it's got the seventh and the third, E and A, and then it has the ninth, 
and the sixth, or the, we sometimes call it the thirteenth. This one has two essential tones and then two color tones. So this is often how we build chords in jazz. Of course, we could have a much, much longer conversation, and I hope we do eventually, <laughs> um, about building chords, um, chord voicings. But the basic of it is that you want to have your two essential tones. It could be the third below the seventh, or it could be the seventh below the third. And then you want to add in one to two color tones in the middle register. We don't repeat the, the root of the chord since that's the job of the bass player. And we want to use as much color as we can, so we don't want to waste color on just repeating that root note. From there, I mean, there's so many things that you can do with this shuttle technique, but one nice one is that you can add some bass fills in here. Um, I think I was kind of subconsciously doing this as I demonstrated before, but... kind of shuttle, which is maybe slightly trickier, depending on the tune, than the left hand shuttle. And that's using a right hand shuttle, shuttling between the melody and the chords. Uh, so what this allows you to do is keep a bass line in two. You could see that now in the left hand. Um, and that can provide really the rhythmic and harmonic backbone. But then we could get some chords in here. The chords that I, I've given here are just about exactly the same as I had in the left hand. It's still two essential tones plus maybe one or two color tones. Um, but now I'm adding them in the gaps in the melody. share the chords and the melody referred to as the third hand technique. And it's associated with the pianist Dave McKenna, who was a pianist out of Boston. Um, in, this was from like the glory days where hotel and lounge piano and jazz piano like kind of overlapped and intermingled. And Dave McKenna had this like really long running uh, solo piano gig at a fancy hotel, but also was a recitalist and a recording artist and a fantastic pianist. And he was known for being able to make it sound like he had a third hand by sharing the chords and the melody between the right, uh, in, within the right hand. You know, another way to think about this, and I use this term kind of in contrast with the term shuttle, is to drape the chords from the right hand melody notes. And when you do this, the chords and the melody will come together. So you don't have to be going back and forth. Instead, <laughs> chords whenever I have a longer note. Um, and usually, you could probably guess this by now, what I'm grabbing for most of all is the third and the seventh, and then a color note if I can get it. I'll show that to you one more time. Much less complicated because you don't have to be going back and forth. You don't have to be 
figuring out a comping rhythm um, in the right hand, uh, but it does mean you're often just spreading your hand and you're having to find chords and melody at the same time. It's not pianistically easy. This is hard for an intermediate level. I know that's probably what you are all thinking. It's like, this is intermediate? <laughs> um, cool, before we move on from the intermediate album, any jazz presentation I feel like is incomplete if we don't talk about albums, if we don't talk about listening. So I wanted to give you um, some recommended solo piano albums. Um, it's been kind of a project of mine in my book. Um, I have albums that correlate with each chapter and then a list of my favorite or 50 of maybe the most influential solo piano albums. Um, and then on my website, I actually try, I've been working on a list of every solo jazz piano album in existence. And I think I have the best list anywhere on the internet. Of course, I don't claim that it's incredibly complete. Um, but these are five great ones to write down, take a screenshot. Um, I'm also gonna be providing a handout with all these slides. And then here's five recommended solo, uh, modern solo piano albums by artists like Keith Jarrett, Herbie Hancock, my teacher Fred Hirsch, the great Brad Meldau, and a younger Armenian pianist Tigran Hamasayan. So again, take a screenshot, jot these down, or look at the handout that I've attached. All right, so as we get to advanced level, you know, maybe some of you are ready for this, um, but I hope even if you're not feeling totally ready for this, that this can help you appreciate and understand what's happening as professional jazz pianists play solo piano. It's worth noting that I always recommend that uh, students and teachers write out these styles before you attempt to just improvise them. I think it's unreasonable, you know, with all of these calculations of third, seventh, melody, personalization, baseline, you know, it's somewhat unreasonable to think that you're going to be able to come up with them off the top of your head. So first, what I do is I arrange six or seven tunes in whatever style I'm aspiring to. And then I go back and I try to do some tunes only partially written out, maybe with skeleton phrases. Um, and then maybe I'll be at the level where I think, oh, I could sit down and try to play through a tune without necessarily writing it out. So it's a laborious process. It's hard. Um, but that's the, that's the gig. <laughs> so shared hand voicings are a key part of jazz style, especially if we're playing a ballad, um, but really in any jazz style. And this basically means that both hands are sharing the chord in the middle. So. Let me get the camera on my finger. So you can see both of my hands are extended as far as they will go. enough to know that some of you are like, I'm checking out, I see temps, I'm out of here. But please don't go. <laughs> um, it's very common for people, including myself, to not be able to reach temps. Um, I can reach some of them, but those black to white key temps, I totally can't reach. Um, jazz pans just get very good at rolling um, and doing very fast rolls. What I do, you know, if I have to play E flat to G, is I play the E flat slightly before the beat, and I roll, I roll into it. to see, so I do a very fast roll. Tenths are a big part of the style, because what they let you do is they let you play that third on the bottom and put the bass note lower, right? We want to keep that bass note low. So that's why tenths are so important, um, because if I wasn't using tenths, I'd be up with the bass in the middle register instead of in the low register. So I prefer people to roll chords than to not, uh, than to check out on the tenths. So don't be intimidated by the large intervals. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it helps to have larger hands, <laughs> like it just does. Oscar Peterson is known for being able to reach about a 12th. Um, I wish I could reach a 12th, but I can't, uh, but that's no reason to give up. Uh, you can still play really big, full, satisfying chords, even with smaller hands. Okay, um, I'm gonna briefly run through these rules for shared hands voicings. This is two chapters in my book. If you're really interested, I'd recommend the book. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're harmonizing the melody note that happens right as a chord changes. At the beginning, I suggest using five notes. One is the melody, one is the bass, and then three of your choosing. Each chord needs to have the third and the seventh, or the sixth, if it's a sixth chord. 
and then we're going to not double notes. And so this gets interesting because if the melody is, a thir is the third of the chord, then we're going to come up with a different voicing because we're not going to double the third down below. So what's interesting about this style is I can't give you a formula that says, oh, it's going to be third, seventh, ninth, fifth, because it's really going to depend on what that melody note is. We're going to play, you know, we're going to have different options for color tones if the fifth is in the melody rather than if the ninth is in the melody. Okay. Um, I'm going through what is many weeks of work in a very short amount of time. You want to space your notes as evenly as possible. You don't want to have kind of a cluster in the right hand and then nothing in the left hand. Um, you want to keep the bass low but beware lower interval limits. That means you don't want to get into those muddy chords. So that's why your hand is going to be kind of stretched all the time. And of course, the voicing must be playable. I have people who turn in uh, assignments on these shared hand voicings and they write something that's like spread, you know, to the absolute outer range of the piano. And there's a practical element, um, especially when you're playing solo jazz piano. Okay, but what can you actually do with these shared hand voicings? One thing is that you could comp with them. So. Charleston pattern again and if you look at the chords like for instance it's very easy to see in the E7 you have the third the G sharp the seventh is the D and the B flat that's the flat five so again it's the same formula two essential tones one color tone in this F6 you have A and E that's your third and seventh and you have D and G that's your sixth or thirteenth and your ninth two essential tones, two color tones. So it's the same, this is just spreading it out more beautifully than we can if we have the chords in just one hand. Um, I'm somebody who's obsessed with jazz ballads uh, and I've taken to trying to categorize them so that I can teach them better and um, write about them in books. And one ballad style I love is called the repeated quarter note ballad. And what you're gonna do here is you're gonna keep time with by repeating an inner note of the ballad while everything else holds. So for example, I'm using the shared hands voicings and I'm just repeating the top note of the left hand. And it's a professional Sarmé jazz ballad. Interesting because one way in which jazz ballads and pop ballads on the piano differ is that this would actually start, to my ears at least, sounding like a pop ballad if I repeated the whole chord. Obviously the harmony is a little bit different, but the feeling is different in a pop ballad. So for a jazz ballad, we want to keep it really light, especially on these repeated quarter notes. Um, I always think of them as like the brushes on the drum set. So once you can play your shared hands voicings, it's actually fairly easy to transition it into this repeated quarter note ballad. The other ballad style uh, that's really interesting to people, I call the stop start rubato ballad. Um, and in this ballad style, we, we pause at the ends of phrases and provide some sort of a musical commentary. Often for a professional pianist, it's something virtuoso, virtuosic, a, a arpeggio, a scale, some sort of improvised fill, but um, it could be something simple like a bell tone. Um, start rubato instead of just rubato um, because it's less about just that having a shift um, in timing and more about like taking long cadenzas potentially so let me let me demonstrate uh, what it might sound like
that might be you know an overly stretched out uh, ballad but I wanted to show you that it's for a lot of great artists it's about really taking time and stretching and improvising and creating between these chords but again what are the voicings I'm using I'm just using the shared hands voicings here and then I'm doing other stuff in between and again there's a lot of information about this in the book of some options of what you can do in between if, if you're interested Okay, and we talked a little bit earlier about stride piano, and that is definitely an option here. This is not a part of shared hand voicings. This would be a different category. Um, stride piano is endlessly fascinating to me. Uh, there's so many genius stride pianists throughout the decade. I hate to keep bringing up my book, but there's four chapters on ways to play stride piano. But if you look here, you can see that on the strong beats, what do we have? We have a bass line in two. Right, root to fifth, root to third, root to fifth. It's just like our bass line in two. And what do we have on our offbeats? You're already familiar with this equation. It's these rootless voicings that have our two essential tones and then one or two other um, color tones. Now I left the right hand plain, but of course we're gonna be personalizing our melody in the right hand. So uh, stride piano, I think many of you know what it sounds like. so I'm gonna keep moving. <laughs> um, now, I'll give you one hint about why some jazz pianists stride piano might sound better than others, or maybe it sounds better than yours, which is that, you know, when you think about ragtime, usually it's one note or an octave happening on the downbeat. For really great jazz pianists, often they're using more notes on the downbeat, right? More notes, we like more notes in jazz. So, again, it's these bigger chords. richness, especially at slower tempos, we can hear it's very rich. It's a cheesecake of stride piano. Some practice tips, because I bet you're feeling intimidated. First one is listening is absolutely essential. Second thing I already gave you, write it out before you play it. One of the things that's hard about jazz is that you're creating something and you're performing it at the same time. In classical music, we separate these steps. Somebody creates it and then we work on that performance. Um, but in jazz, it can be really good practice to separate those steps as well. I see even really good classical pianists forget to do all of the good practice habits they do in classical music and jazz, which is to play it really slow, divide by sections, try just playing the first four measures at once and then practice hands separately as well. Uh, the fourth bullet is learn rules and then break them. I know j jazz is on some level about freedom, but if you don't learn any rules, then you're probably uh, not learning anything. <laughs> you're probably just gonna do the same things that you always do. And then create small goals. I see this all the time in people who know what good jazz sounds like and wanna create good jazz, um, and they think that they're gonna get there really fast uh, but it doesn't work like that. Think about it happening in the same time frame as language learning. Uh, yes, you could learn a few vocabulary words or some grammar rules, but to really get to where the point where you can have a conversation, it might take months of immersion or even years of study. So what you need to do is create small goals. Instead of trying to be able to play every tune as a stride piano tune, learn to play one or two tunes as a stride piano tune, right? Um, and hopefully some of the things that I've showed you today are really useful in terms of um, having some small goals, some intermediary steps between what you can do now and what the greats of jazz piano do. And then I have this slide, which is six levels of listening. Um, and this is so important. Remember, jazz is an oral language. It's not just a thing that we say. That is absolutely true, and it absolutely needs to be part of any uh, jazz musician's practice routine. So of course, you can listen as background music while you're doing the dishes, while you're driving to work. Um, you can listen to eyes closed, focusing on the music, which is fantastic. If you haven't done that recently, please do it. It's so soul, soul enriching. Um, 
listening to one track on repeat. In my newer book, Jazz Piano Fundamentals, I suggest uh, for each guided listening activity that you listen 20 times at least, and that's minimally. Um, listening at your instrument, starting and stopping, getting inspired by something, and then saying, ooh, that was kind of neat. What if I tried something similar on this tune that I'm playing, right? Maybe it's, um, you hear somebody playing a scale leading up to a note. And you're like, oh, that's kind of a cool idea. I've never thought to do that. So now I'm playing Misty. What if I go? You know, and I play all these scales leading up to melody notes. It could be something as, as simple as that. But you want to start accumulating these tricks, um, accumulating these musical elements from musicians that you love. Next level of listening is singing what you hear. Learning to sing a solo is so important to getting the grammar of the music into your ear. And lastly, you all are probably familiar with the fact that jazz musicians do a lot of transcribing, which is writing down what they hear in a performance. You could also simply learn it on the instrument. Um, both are useful. I think some transcriptions, it's great to write down because then you can do really detailed analysis. Other transcriptions, um, you could do by ear and learn to play on your instrument more to get the grammar of jazz into your ear. Okay, that feels like a really good place to leave it. I have these artist level slides, which I will put into um, the PDF document that you should be able to access here. Um, but uh, last thing is some ways to keep in touch with me. I've got a bunch of books for sale at my shop. Um, I have a YouTube channel where I give uh, little lessons on jazz piano about twice a week. Um, I have a beginning jazz piano class I offer through my community college, um, or you can send me an email and uh, get to know me that way. So um, I just want to give you a ton of gratitude for watching my session and sticking through all the way to the end. Again, my name is Jeremy Siskin. Thanks to MTNA, and I hope to see you all in person very, very soon. Take care, everybody.